is everybody doing? <laughs> uh, that took me by surprise. <laughs> I made a whole bunch of changes for this show, some new stuff that I'll tell you about in a minute. So anyway, uh, welcome to Join Hands with Heaven. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Blue Tap. Here is my mission statement. So in John, in, uh, John 4, 24, Jesus tells us to worship God in spirit and in truth. And here is our truth right here. This is the Holy Bible, and this is the foundation of everything we believe as Christians. So that is the truth part of it. The spirit part of it is the Holy Spirit that lives within every single believer in Jesus Christ. So the truth has to work along with the spirit in order for us to walk in the love, peace, joy, victory, and freedom of Jesus Christ. You have to have them both working together. You can't have just one or the other. So we are saved only by the blood of Jesus Christ, and Jesus is Lord. So again, and thank you so much for watching. I'm Blue Tap. This is Join Hands with Heaven. Um, okay, I am live streaming simultaneously on Facebook and YouTube. And here are the new things. I'm actually finally live streaming, I believe, on X, which used to be Twitter. Um, so I have, after many, many tries, I think I'm finally actually live streaming on X. So if anybody's watching me over there, hello, welcome. So it was a long process. I had to wait to be verified as like a blue check uh, user. So I now am an official blue check user over on X. So yay. I'm also live streaming on Instagram and on Rumble. So hello to everybody. Um, so if you're on any of those other um, uh, on any of those uh, social media platforms, please look me up over there. If you're on the other ones and follow me, um, I am, my profile on every single one of them is blue tap, just my name, except on YouTube. YouTube is the only one that I don't have my actual same, just blue tap. So here is my YouTube handle. That's my YouTube address right there. So anyway, the reason I'm saying this, I can see your comments sometimes if you're on Facebook during the live stream. I also have a window open over here uh, where I can see Instagram. Oh, let's see. Hold on a second. Let me get that over there. So yeah, so if you're watching this on Instagram, oh, I don't know. Maybe I can see you. I don't know if I can or not. Let's see. Going over to my, oh, okay. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if this is actually working on Instagram. Anyway, uh, okay, so just I, I won't be able to see you if you comment on Instagram. So, but where I can see you, the best place to watch my live streams is on YouTube. So that's why I have this down here, okay? So um, I prefer YouTube because um, the chat room works really great. I'm in StreamYard right now, but I can see if, you, um, if you're watching me on YouTube and you make any comments in the chat room, I can see it immediately you, so you can interact live with me, but you can also interact with other users who are watching um, and in the chat room on YouTube. So please um, check me out on YouTube, um, even if you are watching me somewhere else, but you also have a YouTube account, please check me out on YouTube and, and please subscribe. I'm a shameless promotion. I am trying to build my YouTube channel. So there it is. Okay. And speaking of that, let me go over to the comments now because I see there's some comments. So hi, hello, Scott. Let me put these comments up here. Hello, Scott and Renee. Hi, Renee. I did see your comment, Renee, um, before I started, but it was like right, it was too late for me to like get on and say hello. So we didn't have our normal pre-show chat. Yes, I agree. Please pray for Israel tonight. So um, I agree with that. I'm definitely praying for Israel. Also praying for all the people in North Carolina and in Tennessee and Florida who've just been hit with the hurricane and the flooding and everything. I used to live in Black Mountain, North Carolina, which is right outside of Asheville. So that's one of the places that's been hit the hardest. And so I'm just my heart breaks for those people. And Betty, hello, Betty. Hello, sister. Oh, Joni, no way. Hi, Joni. <laughs> How are you doing, sister? I miss you. So Joni's one of my friends from St. Charles, where I used to live. So I haven't seen her in person in a long time. It's good to see you here. All right, so let's see. Let me go back to my banners and get rid of that. Okay, all right, so thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Uh, we have spent the past two weeks talking about the gift of speaking in tongues. Um, and so today we're gonna continue that conversation. Um, so I want to do kind of a little quick little review um, to make sure everybody's up to speed, we're all on the same page. And if somebody is just tuning in for the very first time. So, so the first two weeks ago, uh, I told my story about how I started speaking in tongues. So if you're interested, if you didn't hear that two weeks ago and you're interested, that was two weeks ago, you can find it on my YouTube channel. Um, and then I also two weeks ago started going through all of the scriptures 
um, that we find in the Bible that mention the gift of speaking in tongues. So we started that two weeks ago and we finished up last week. And there's really not that many scriptures in the entire Bible that mention speaking in tongues. So it did not take us very long to do. In fact, here they are right here. This is all the scriptures <laughs> in the whole Bible <laughs> that talk about speaking in tongues. So you can see it's not very much. So what I want to do is just really, really super fast. I want to do kind of a, a review of these five scriptures. And so, um, so we'll, so to kind of re refresh your memory. So anyway, Mark 16, the only time in, in the gospels or in the whole Bible where Jesus himself mentions speaking in tongues. And so this is at the very end of Mark, at the end of his, Jesus's time here on earth, he's speaking to his disciples. He has just given them the great commission. And he says, these signs will follow, will accompany those who believe. And that list he gives them includes they will speak in tongues. Okay. So that's the only time Jesus ever mentions it. So, and I will, I do have to tell you this, that that passage, there's a little bit of controversy about that particular passage in Mark, because some of the older manuscripts of the book of Mark do not include this passage. So there are some uh, Bible scholars who argue that Maybe Mark didn't actually write that part of it, that passage, and maybe it was added later. So I just want to make sure you understand you, you are aware of that controversy. There are other Bible scholars who um, argue that it is included in enough of the older manuscripts that we can consider it to be legitimately from Mark. So not quite sure. Unfortunately, there are some instances where it appears that some things have been added to the Bible later. If you have a good version of uh, a good Bible version, then there will probably be a footnote uh, somewhere on your, on your, in, in your Bible telling you that. So, so anyway, um, so it is possible that Jesus did not say that. It is possible that he did. Okay. So just so you have that clear, then we've got in Acts three times, three times the gift of speaking in tongues is, is spoken about. And the first one is Acts 2. So this is the Pentecost. So you're familiar with this story. So this was when uh, the, the Holy Spirit infilled the, the believers in Jesus Christ for the very first time. And um, then the disciples under the power of the Holy Spirit were able to go out and to speak to all the people who had gathered to, um, uh, to Jerusalem for the festival of Pentecost, who were from all over the place and spoke different languages. And under the power of the Holy Spirit, the disciples were able to tell the gospel message of Jesus Christ in all these different languages that they did not know themselves so that everyone there would be able to hear the gospel message in their own language. So that is the first time that we ever see this gift of speaking in tongues in action in the Bible, and that is at Pentecost. Then we have Acts 10, and that's where we see uh, Gentiles, Gentile believers, for the very first time, being baptized in the Spirit and speaking in tongues. And then Acts 19, we see uh, Jewish believers uh, get baptized in the spirit when Paul lays hands on them and then they speak in tongues and they prophesy. So that's it for Acts. We have three times in the whole book of Acts where we see uh, the gift of speaking in tongues mentioned. Okay. Then the only other place in the whole Bible where we see, where we hear about the gift of speaking in tongues is in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. So in first Corinthians and Paul actually goes into great detail in first Corinthians talking about the gift of speaking in tongues and other gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and then in chapter 14. So last week we finished going through these scriptures and looked at all of these. And so that's where we ended up. And so as we're looking at those scriptures, we were, um, we were trying to see if we could find answers to the, these questions. So the first question that I was hoping we could find answers for in the Bible is what exactly is the gift of tongues? And so I, I talked about this last week that I believe from these scriptures here, I believe that we can uh, that, that we can see three different kinds of speaking in tongues that are that are described in the, the scriptures in the New Testament. And so these are the first one would be Acts 2, which is the Pentecost. And that's a very specific kind of situation where the uh, where somebody needs to hear the gospel message, but there's no one available to speak in their language. And so the Holy Spirit would give somebody the ability to speak the gospel message in that language or the person would hear it in their own language and be able to understand it. So that's the first kind. The second kind is this 
personal prayer language that I believe that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 14. And where he says you're, that your spirit is praying, is speaking mysteries, and you are speaking only to God because no one else understands it. And so that's why I believe that that particular passage in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2, is speaking about this personal, private prayer language that you only speak directly to God in, in your, you know, privately in your prayer time with God. Um, okay, so that's the second kind. The third kind that Paul also describes in 1 Corinthians 14 would be when God is speaks through the gift of speaking in tongues um, through someone who has that gift to a, a specific body of believers in a church, okay, or a church, you know, with a body of believers group that are meeting together. And then God would choose to speak a message to them uh, through somebody that has this gift of tongues. But now this particular kind of tongues, it, uh, it inclu includes a stipulation, a requirement that it should only be done, practiced when there is somebody else present in the same place who also has the gift of interpretation of tongues. So that, that after that tongues is given, then some, that person could interpret it so that everybody else would be able to understand what was said. So these are the three kinds of different kinds of speaking in tongues that I believe we see in the scriptures. Okay. So the second question is, what is the purpose of the gift of tongues? And I believe there are different purposes for each of the three kinds. So the first kind, the Acts 2 situation, very, very obviously would be, the purpose would be spreading the gospel message. So the personal prayer language, Paul explains in 2 Corinthians, I think it's verse 4, uh, 1 Corinthians, sorry, 1 Corinthians uh, 14, verse 4, um, he explains that, that, um, that prayer language edifies the speaker. So that would be the purpose of the private prayer language is it edifies the speaker. And I, I can attest to that. I'm going to talk about that more in a little bit. Okay. And then the third kind is this public word to a church body. And so this would simply be just one of the many ways that God might choose to speak to a specific body of believers in the church uh, through this means of uh, somebody that has the gift of tongues. And then again, that has the, the requirement, the stipulation that somebody else has to be present who also has the gift of interpretation so that they can explain what that word meant. So that is where we ended up last week. And so what I want to do now this week is I want to spend a little bit more time looking through 1 Corinthians 14. Um, because Paul, I believe that Paul, he goes into so much detail when he's talking about the gift of tongues. And so I, I believe that he reveals a lot. This is a very mysterious gift. Uh, a lot of people like, you know, don't don't know anything about it. They don't understand how it works. I don't, none of us really understand everything that there is to know about it. It's a very mysterious gift, and but I believe that we can that that we can learn a lot about it if we just really look carefully at what Paul says in his letter letter to the Corinthians. All right, so let's take a look at that. All right, so this is First Corinthians fourteen. So if you remember, if you were here last week. So in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul goes through this long thing where he is doing this comparison contrast between the gift of speaking in tongues and the gift of prophecy. Okay, if you remember that. So, and, and his whole point is he's trying to kind of uh, downplay the gift of speaking in tongues. He keeps saying it's the least of the gifts and it's much better to prophesy. It's much better to prophesy because when you speak in tongues, you're only speaking, you know, it's, it's only personal. It's a personal language and nobody else understands what you're talking about. But if you speak, if you prophesy, that edifies the whole church because everybody understands what you're saying. So he's, he's downplaying it, downplaying. It. And I think one of the reasons why he's doing this, he's not saying that the gift of tongues is not good. He's not saying it's bad and that you don't want to do it. Um, not at all. It's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, of course, it's very important. The Holy Spirit has given it to us for a reason. So it's important. But I think what has happened here, if you if you watched my live stream two weeks ago when I told my story about when I started speaking in tongues. And a year earlier, I had been going to one of these very charismatic churches who uh, focused just focused so much only on the gift of tongues that they elevated it way above everything else. And so it really created a very unbalanced teaching, caused a lot of problems in the church where you had, it, it just kind of divided the church between people who spoke in tongues and people who didn't speak in tongues. So people who didn't speak in tongues felt really 
you know, kind of ostracized. And then I think it caused pride problems for people who did because of the way it was focused on. They, they focused on it so much and talked about it all the time. And, um, and I believe that is a very unbalanced way to look at the gift of tongues. And so I think maybe that is exactly what was happening in this Corinthian church. Uh, this early Corinthian church, that they were doing the same thing, that they were elevating this gift of tongues. That's a very showy gift. And so that church I had gone to, um, they had all these times within their services where people could just yell out in tongues. And it was, it was a very, it, it caused a lot of confusion and it caused all these problems. And I think you can tell from the way Paul talks about it, that the same kind of thing was happening in this early Corinthian church. And so that's why I think he spent so much time comparing these two gifts. He was trying to straighten people out uh, so that they had a more uh, accurate, balanced view of the gift of tongues. Yes, it is the least of the gifts. It is still important, but it shouldn't be elevated and focused on so much to the detriment of all the other gifts. So, so anyway, let's see what he says here in 1 Corinthians 14. So uh, verse 2. For the one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. Um, so, so the reason why I think that this is speaking about this private prayer language is because that's a very good description of what, what I experience in, in my private prayer language. So I am speaking, um, speaking directly to God. You know, I'm not, this is in my personal prayer time. I'm not speaking to anyone else. And it is mysteries. It is mysteries because it is the spirit, the Holy Spirit speaking through my spirit. And I, my mind, I do not know what word for word, what is being said when I am praying in tongues. And now this is a problem for a lot of people. A lot of people have trouble with the fact and they're bothered by and, and, and suspicious of the fact that your mind does not know what you're saying. And so I'm going to talk about that in depth in, in just a minute. Okay. So, um, but this is what I experience when I pray in tongues. Um, and then, but then let's look at what he says here in verse four, the one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Okay. So this is Paul explaining the purpose of uh, this private prayer language tongue, what he's describing right here. It edifies the speaker. And so, so many people might wonder, how, if you don't, if your mind doesn't know what you're saying, how does it edify you? How, how does it benefit you? What do you get out of it if your mind has no idea what you're saying? And so I can, let me explain from my experience how I feel like speaking in tongues, praying in tongues benefits me. How does it edify me? And my personal experience is that, first of all, because of the way I started speaking in tongues, um, I was all by myself. I was not asking for the gift of tongues. I was not seeking it. I was simply alone praying to God. And I started speaking in tongues. It just kind of came out of me. Just It was a very miraculous event. And because I was not, I was not actively asking for it, I, and, and I had experienced a year before going to church that, you know, the church that I explained, described a minute ago that where they elevated it so much. And during the time I was going to that church, I really, really wanted it. Like everybody else that went to that church did because of the way they taught about it. And I asked for it. I, I prayed for it, but I would never was, it never came. It never came. And they even had, you know, would try to coach people how to speak in tongues by saying things like gotta have a Honda over and over and over again. And I never did that because that's not, I didn't, that did not sound right to me, but, but I never got this, this gift during the time I was going to that church. So a year later I had moved on. I had forgotten about it. I wasn't even asking for this gift anymore and just spontaneously came out as I was praying. And this was 40 years ago. And I still have been able to speak in tongues this whole time. And I practice it every day at this point. And um, so anyway, for me, because of the way it happened, it was all alone, wasn't asking for it. Um, it was not in, it was not some sort of a, an emotionally charged situation. I wasn't trying, nobody was coaching me. Nobody was laying hands on me or anything. It just came out. And so I was very aware of how miraculous it was at the time. And even today, uh, 40 years later, I'm still very struck by how miraculous it is um, that I can, that, that God will do this thing through me, that the Holy Spirit will speak through my spirit and, and use my, my tongue and my mouth to speak in this prayer language. And it is, it is a very miraculous activity. And um, so for me, that really, um, that really strengthens my faith. 
Um, and it's an act of faith just to, 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 to do that and to believe that, you know, God really is, the Holy Spirit really is speaking through you. So it's, for me, it strengthens my faith. Um, and, uh, and then one of the other things is that it, that it edifies me is that it just speaking in tongues, the act of speaking in tongues, you are setting aside your own personal control over your physical body. Um, and you are allowing, you are submitting and surrendering to the Holy Spirit to allow the Holy Spirit to control your spirit, control your tongue, your mouth, your vocal cords. Um, and so just doing that is beneficial. I think it's a very benef beneficial thing to learn how to do. It's a way to submit and to surrender to the Lord. Um, and the other thing is, is that I believe, and I'm going to give you a scripture to support what I'm getting ready to say in just a minute. But I believe that when you are speaking in tongues, when you are praying in the spirit in this way, that it is the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of every believer in Jesus Christ. So it is the Holy Spirit inside of me speaking through my spirit and um, everything that is verbalized, everything that comes out since it's the Holy Spirit praying, interceding for me. Um, it is everything that is prayed, even though I don't understand it with my mind, it is, within, it is in alignment with the will of God. And I think that is an incredibly powerful. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in depth in a little bit tonight. But, um, you know, there's a lot of times when you don't know what to pray. Uh, I pray for a lot of people. Uh, and I'm sure that, that all of you have had a similar experience where, you know, you're praying for a certain person or for a situation. And it's just such a crazy situation that you really have no idea what the will of God is for this person or in this situation. And so me, for me, it's very comforting because in this situation, I just, I can pray in my tongue and I believe that whatever is being verbalized is, is the, the Holy Spirit interceding for this person or for this situation in alignment with the will of God. And so that's very comforting because otherwise, if you're just praying in your own language, sometimes you have no idea what to say, you know, God help them. <laughs> you know, that's all you can say. You don't know what to pray. And so in those cases, um, I will just, I, I pray in my tongue. And so that's very comforting. So those are the ways that personally, my experience of speaking in tongues, praying in tongues edifies me. And that's just me, my personal experience. I'm sure that other people who speak in tongues may have other things that they could add to that list as well. So, so I'd like to hear from you on this. If you do have a prayer language and, and pray in tongues, it, are there other ways that you feel that praying in tongues edifies you, benefits your, your spirit and benefits you? I'd like to hear from you on that. If, if you could um, uh, write in the chat room or send me comments, and I'd love to hear your stories about that as well. All right, so let's see. Let's go on and see what else Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14. Okay, so verse 14, he says, Paul says, If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unproductive. So this is very interesting here. Now this, I mentioned it a minute ago, this is the sticking point for a lot of Christians. This is what makes a lot of Christians very suspicious about the gift of tongues. It makes them fearful, maybe even afraid of the gift of tongues. It's not anything they want to do with because of that, the aspect of it that their mind does not know what is happening. Paul says it right here. Paul is admitting that this is the case. When you are speaking in tongues, your mind has no idea what you're saying. And so for a lot of people, that is very, that's just weird. That is, makes them uncomfortable because a lot of people really want to, they really want to figure it all out. They don't want there to be any kind of mystery to, to anything that they practice in their, in their faith. Um, and uh, and so, so that's why a lot of people believe a lot of people are, are afraid of this gift. I believe that's why a lot of people are, I, that's where cessationism comes from, is, is, that, is, is that people are very fearful of the mystery um, of some of this, of all of the gifts, the supernatural aspect of following God. Um, for me, the mist, I don't mind the mystery at all. In fact, I love it. Um, I would not want to have a God who is small enough for me to figure out with my own stupid human brain. Um, so that means that, that, that God, I mean, I wouldn't even worship a God like that, right? Um, God is so much bigger than us. We cannot understand him. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So that means there's a lot of mystery, a lot of things that we just can't fathom with our own stupid human minds. And to me, I love that. I embrace that. 
about God. So the fact that, you know, there's a, a lot of mystery behind this gift of speaking in tongues, it does not bother me at all. And I think that one of the reasons why people are so bothered by this, well, first of all, we are made in the image of God. Um, so, so, you know, God, the Trinity, we believe in the Trinity as Christians. So that's God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, three different aspects, one God. And it is a great mystery right there, even though we believe it, even though people who, you know, are uncomfortable with mysteries say that they believe that as a Christian, that these are, you know, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. How in the world could that be true? How could Jesus have died on the cross and God have, you know, how we have no idea how that could be true. It is a great mystery. So we are similar in the fact that we are triune beings. Now, I don't mean we are gods, absolutely not, but we are made, God made us in his image. And one of the ways we are in his image is that we have several different parts of us as well. And it is all wrapped up into one being. So we have our physical body, Okay, that is the part of us that is temporary, that is wasting away, that someday is going to die and return to dust. We have our consciousness, so that's our thoughts, our emotions. Okay, that's another part of us. And then we have our souls. And our souls are the eternal part of us that are going to last forever. They are never going to end. And um, so I think for people in our culture, in this postmodern uh, Western culture, there really is this great disconnect between our minds, our thoughts, and our soul, the eternal part of us, because our Western culture is very, very uh, fixated, very, very obsessed with the physical, everything physical. And so they have a lot of, a lot of people in our culture have trouble believing in anything supernatural. Um, you know, there are, think about it, there are a lot of people running around today who have no idea that they even have a soul. They think when they die, they're just gonna, it just ends. Now, hopefully if you're a Christian, you at least believe that you have a soul because it's a very important part of our, our belief system as Christians. But even so, because of our Western culture, it has seeped into our thinking. I mean, we, we, we're surrounded by it. It's all that we know. And so a lot of Christians are very stuck in the physical, very stuck in the physical. And so they are very suspicious and fearful of anything supernatural, even though we have a lot of biblical foundation, a lot of bi biblical support for believing in the supernatural and these things really are real and, and can come from God. Um, okay. So anyway, so, so the, the whole point is this disconnect between our, our minds and, uh, and our souls. And so that is why a lot of people would be uh, very, very worried about the fact that Paul says, if you pray in a tongue, your spirit prays, but your mind is unproductive. But Paul says it right here. So let's see, what is Paul's response about that? He's admitting it right here. My mind is unproductive. So what does Paul say? Does he say, well, oh, we can't do it then. If, unless my mind is involved, we can't do this thing talking in tongues. It's too risky. So and here's what he says, verse 15. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit, but I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit, but I will sing with the mind also. So here is Paul's response. He doesn't seem to be bothered at all by the fact that our minds are unproductive when we speak in tongues. He says, no, I'm just, let's cover it all. I'm not going to just pray in tongues. I'm going to pray in my language as well. I'm going to do both. And that is what I do. I don't just pray in tongues. I also pray in English. Um, so I think this is a very balanced, uh, a very balanced response to this, this uh, thing about speaking in tongues that your mind is, is not productive. So I think that this verse 15 should be very comforting to anyone who has a fearfulness of this gift of speaking in tongues because it's not using your mind. So, so anyway, verse 15, 1 Corinthians 14, I think is, is, it is a very comforting verse for anybody that struggles with that. Okay, so that is what I wanted to look at in 1 Corinthians. There is one other scripture that I want to look at. Uh, and this is from Paul's letter to the Romans. And now Paul, in this scripture, he does not specifically mention speaking in tongues. But I think, and this is my opinion, I think that Paul is talking about speaking in tongues, or, or, or at least it is included in what he says here. So let's look at this. This is Romans 8, 26 and 27. He says, now in the same way, 
the spirit, the Holy Spirit also helps our weakness. And I want to go back a little bit because anytime you see a passage of scripture that starts with like, therefore, or in the same way, or, you know, some, something like that, you need to back up a little bit to see what exactly in, in what way is he talking about? So we see right before this, Paul saying that we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only that, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our body. So he's talking about the fact that we are living within this cursed body with these cursed you know, minds that only see darkly right now. We cannot know the whole truth. We don't have our glorified minds, don't have our glorified bodies. So that's what he's saying. Okay, so then in the same way, verse 26, the Holy Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we should, but the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he, God, who searches the hearts, knows the, what the mind of the Holy Spirit is, because the Holy Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so now I believe that speaking in a prayer language, speaking in tongues, this gift of the Holy Spirit is included within this. And so that what is happening, what is really happening when you are speaking in tongues is the Holy Spirit is interceding for us, uh, controlling, speaking through our spirit, controlling our, our, our mouth and our tongue and our, uh, and our vocal cords and speaking out according to the will of God. So everything that you are praying is according to the will of God when you are praying in tongues. That is what I believe, and that's why I believe it. All right, so that is what I wanted to talk about to kind of finish up last week. So what I want to do, I'm going to take a little break and look at your at your um, at your comments. Let's see here. Go back to the comments. Okay, let's see what we got. Dina, hi, Dina, and Ramona. Hey, Ramona. Uh, I've gotten your emails and I, I'm going to try to write back to you at length soon. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Show the comments. Dina, Ramona. Let's see. Okay. Oops, typo. Pray without ceasing. Ramona. Yes, I'm actually going to, I'm going to quote that verse a little bit later. Okay. So just wanted to check your comments. Um, all right. So what I want to do now for the rest of the time, what are we at? 32. Oh, I got to speed up. Okay. It might go a little bit over time today. I've got a lot of stuff I want to get through. There are a lot of, I've at this point received so many emails from people uh, and comments from people telling me your stories and questions and comments that people wanted me to talk about. So um, what I want to do is I'm going to finish up all of this today. And then next week I'm going to spend the whole live stream going over people's comments, telling, sharing people's stories. Um, and I think that is going to be a lot of fun and very, very interesting. So, so please uh, join me again next week for that. So, okay. So here's what I want to do for the rest of my time today. So, so I want to share some deeper, what I believe that God, some things God has shown me, I believe about a deeper purpose and power uh, behind this gift of speaking in tongues. So, and some of this comes from my own personal experiences, speaking in tongues, some things I believe God has revealed to me. And then also some of this is coming from my education. And now I don't mention this a lot because I feel like it's hard to talk about it without sounding braggy. And believe me, I'm not being braggy at all. I don't think I'm brilliant or anything, but I do have uh, multiple degrees in, in language. I went to college for over a decade and I, I've worked through and gotten received multiple degrees, higher education, graduate level degrees. I have a master's degree in English literature. Um, at the PhD level, I have studied um, rhetoric and composition. I have studied linguistics and I've studied first and second language acquisition. And so what that is, is uh, what happens in the brain when a child learns their first language, and then also what happens in the brain uh, when an adult tries to attempts to learn a, a second language or an additional language. So, so I only mention this because uh, I want to I want people to understand that I that I do have a, a background in these sorts of things because speaking in tongues is a kind of language. Uh, it's all about language. <laughs> and so because of my education, I feel like I have maybe a little bit different perspective than a lot of people would have. So that's the only reason I bring that up. So we think a lot of people miss the miracle of language because 
we learn how to speak our native language when we are children. And most of us don't remember the process of learning how to speak our first language. Um, and so because of that, most of us have no memory of at a time when we didn't have language. So it's kind of like a, a, a fish uh, not recognizing water because we've always had language uh, for everything that we can remember. Um, a lot of us, it's something we've never even thought about. We've never given language a second thought, right? Uh, but I'm a geek like that and I really love languages. <laughs> so it's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, but the fact is, that, that language itself is very miraculous, especially first language acquisition. So think about this. The fact that a child, between usually between the ages of one and two, learns an entire language, whatever their native language is, uh, they don't have to take any kind of classes. Nobody teaches them how to speak this language. It's simply absorbed by their little brains, uh, simply because they are surrounded by it, they're hearing it. Uh, whatever language their parents speak and, the, and, and use to speak to them and they're surrounded by. And the fact that they do this um, without ever taking any kind of class and they not only learn this language, they learn how to communicate, they learn how they learn how to use grammatical rules correctly, they learn how to conjugate verbs, they learn all of these things without ever being taught. And it's quite miraculous. In fact, if a child grows up in a multilingual household where they speak more than one language, then they will learn all the languages that are spoken in that house. A second language, a third language, up to four or five languages, as long as they are is spoken enough around them and they are exposed to it enough, they will learn all of those languages simultaneously as a child without ever taking any class. Nobody has to teach them that. They'll also have the ability to code switch and know which language is what. I mean, it is miraculous, but because it's something we don't that most of us don't ever think about, we miss the miracle of it. So if you've ever had the experience of trying to learn a second language as an adult, like in high school or college or something like that, then you probably have had this experience of, of realizing, seeing how difficult it is as an adult to try to learn another language. So I have taken years and years of Spanish and I've taken years and years of Japanese. But after all those years of study, can I speak either of those languages fluently? Oh no, not by a long shot. I can barely speak either of those languages at all because I haven't been surrounded by them and practiced. <laughs> so it has been very, very difficult. And I've worked very, very hard to learn these languages and I still can't speak these languages. Now, every once in a while, there's a person out there that just has a language brain and they can just learn it real fast, but that is not me. <laughs> and so for most of us, it's very, very difficult to try as an adult to learn another language. And so that might give you a little bit of perspective of what a miracle it is that a child learns a language. And so why am I talking about all this? Because I believe that language itself is a miracle. It is a miracle from God that God has given to us. Now, evolutionists will argue that the languages we speak have evolved over time and they started off as, a, as grunts and noises and then evolved into our languages. But if you believe like I do, that the Bible is true, I don't believe that theory of evolution. I believe that God created us and gave us language. So when he created Adam and Eve, he could communicate with them via language. So, um, so I believe that he gave Adam and Eve language. It was part of the package, right? Um, and then in the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, um, at the beginning of the story, everybody in the whole world spoke the same language. And then God struck them and so that they all spoke in different languages. And I believe that story as well. And if you know anything about different languages and the different language families, like the two languages I studied were Japanese and Spanish. Those two languages are so different from each other. Um, they're completely different language families. So I do not believe that there's any way that all of those crazy different uh, languages and language families could have all evolved from human beings. I believe now language does evolve and change over time, but I believe that God started the process and he gave people languages. Okay. So I believe that the Bible alludes to the, the power and the miraculousness of language. And I'm going to read some verses to you to show you what I'm talking about. So it starts in Genesis. All right, so think about Genesis 1. How does it start? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And how did he do that? How did he create? He created by speaking it. 
God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then not only did he speak it into existence, but then he named it. God called the light day and he called the, the darkness night. So naming things, that's another aspect of language, right? So God spoke it into existence and then he named it. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And then God named it. He called the expanse heaven. And then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And then he named it. He called the dry land earth and he called the, the waters the seas. And then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. And it was so. And then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And they shall serve as signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And it was so. And that is when God spoke time into existence. Um, then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly in the earth. And it was so. And God blessed them by saying, be fruitful and multiply. And then God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their kind, livestock, crawling things, animals on the earth. And it was so. And then God said, let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness. And then he blessed them by saying to them, be fruitful and multiply. So you can see here in the very beginning of the New Testament, the, the creative power of language. When God wanted to create things, he spoke it into existence. So this is the beginning of the power of language that we see right here in the very beginning, Genesis 1.1. All right. Then in the beginning of the New Testament, we see it as well. This is in John 1.1. In the beginning was the word. What is a word? A word is a part of language. And the word was with God and the word was God. And who's he talking about? What's he talking about there? He's talking about Jesus. And if you don't, uh, if you doubt that, look at verse 14. He says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he saw, we saw his glory, glory as of the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. So John is equating Jesus to a piece of language. <laughs> so we see the power of language right there. Okay. And then in Romans, Paul tells us this in Romans 10, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith with which we are preaching that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. So confession is a kind of language speaking and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved for with the heart, a person believes resulting in righteousness and with the mouth, he confesses resulting in salvation. So we see here that the power of salvation is in language, is in our words. Then Proverbs 18, 21 tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit, fruit for good or bad. So here we see that the tongue has power over death and life. In Matthew 12, Jesus tells us this. But I tell you that for every careless word that people speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. So here is Jesus himself telling us about the power of language. And he is saying that within our words is the power of justification or condemnation. Jesus said that himself. All right. So we see from these scriptures, the power of language that God has given to language. It, is, it has creative power. It can save or it can kill. It can justify or it can condemn. Language is very powerful. It is very important. All right, so let me ask you this question. And I have a, a very specific reason for asking you this. Does a human, in order for a language to have this power, does it require a human to hear it, to understand it? So in other words, is the power of language that we have seen in all of these scriptures, is that power in language itself or is the power in the hearer when a human being or some other kind of being hears the language that is spoken? And my answer to that is that the power is in the language itself, that God created language to be this powerful. God has ordained the power of language and it does not require a person or any kind of being to hear it or to understand it in order for language to have that power, that creative power, that power to kill or to, to bring life, to save, to justify or condemn. It is the powers in, within the language itself. And so here's why I'm saying this. 
Now, does this make sense so far? <laughs> Here's why I'm saying this. Because remember, a lot of people are bothered by the fact that speaking in tongues your, does not involve your brain. That you don't, your brain is not aware of what you are saying. And for them, that's a, a, that is, makes them nervous. They're suspicious of it because of that. But what I'm saying is that it doesn't matter if your brain doesn't understand what is being said. The Holy Spirit is praying through your spirit, is praying in accordance with the will of God. And that language itself, whether your brain understands it or not, that language itself contains power. It is containing the will of God. It is, it is verbalizing the will of, the God, of God, putting it out there into the atmosphere, the will of God. And that is very, very powerful. And I'm getting ready to talk more in depth about that part of it in just a minute. So what I believe, this is one of the most important reasons for speaking in tongues. This is the power behind speaking in tongues is that it helps to accomplish the will of God, to verbalize the will of God. Uh, the power of language helps accomplish God's will on earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, does God need us to speak in tongues to accomplish his will? Does he need us to pray in alignment with his will in order for his will to be accomplished? Of course not. Of course not. He does not. He's, he's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. But for one reason or another, we can see in the Bible, in the New Testament and the Old Testament, that God chooses over and over and over again to accomplish his will on earth using human beings. Now, he only God knows why he does that and tries to use us because we are stupid, but he does. And this is what he chooses over and over and over again. It's part of his covenant with humanity is that he will not impose his will on us. And so he he chooses to work through us to actually partner with us to accomplish his will on heaven, uh, on earth as it is in heaven. And I, I believe he'd be much better off if he would just push us out of the way and just do what he wants because we screw it up all the time. But this is the way, the way that he chooses to work. And so I believe that one of the most important reasons for speaking in tongues, praying in tongues, is that we are verbalizing the will of God. We are, we are putting language out there that it is, is in alignment with the will of God. And I believe that helps accomplish his will on earth. And it's very, very powerful. Okay, so now I'm going to give you a few more scriptures that I believe push this point home a little bit more uh, of this, this whole idea of the power of spoken languages. Now they're all very short verses. And so what I want to do is I'm going to read all of them and then I'm going to give you some personal commentary at the end of it. Okay. And you'll see why in a minute. All right. All right. So let's go in Mark 11, Jesus says, truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen. It will be granted to him. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted to you. In Luke 11, Jesus says, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. Now which one of you fathers will ask his, will his son ask for a fish? And instead of a fish he will give him a snake. Or he will even, or he will even ask for an egg and his father will give him a scorpion. So if you, Jesus says, if you despite being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? John 14, Jesus says, and whatever you ask, you ask in my name. This I will do so that the father may be glorified in the son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. In John 15, Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. In James, James tells us this. He kind of tells us this is the opposite side. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend what, you're, what you request on your pleasures. In James 5, James tells us this. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him. So, speaking, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will restore the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. 
And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Confession, another kind of language. And pray for one another so that you may be healed. A prayer of a righteous person when it is brought about can accomplish much. And last but not least, John, the Apostle John tells us this in 1 John 5. And this is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, God hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, then we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him, from God. Okay. So why in the world did I read all those crazy scriptures? All right. I think you saw, definitely could see a pattern there. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Here's why I read all those scriptures. I believe now none of those scriptures mention speaking in tongues, but they, they are talking about the power of language, the power of asking God. And now one of the reasons why a lot of people get nervous about those scriptures because those pro those promises, it, those promise scriptures have been abused so much. Uh, I've heard this way too many times, those scriptures being used kind of as like a, a, a magical genie lamp that, um, that, that all you have to do is just ask God whatever you want. And if you just believe it enough and you don't doubt that God has to do it. And that is not what these verses are saying. They are not promising that. That is not biblical. That is an unbalanced uh, way to look at these scriptures. Every single one of the scriptures I read just now has some sort of stipulation, some sort of requirement, a caveat that says something like this, that you have to ask according to God's will. You ask in the name of Jesus. You are asking for the Holy Spirit. You are asking uh, after you have been, if you are abiding in Jesus. So every single one of those promised scriptures has that kind of caveat. So this is not some sort of uh, open license to go run around asking God for whatever you want. God, give me a million dollars. No, it's not. that's not what it's saying at all. This is saying, this is talking about people who are living a sanctified life of submission and surrender to the will of God and are abiding in Jesus Christ. Now, if you live that kind of life, then those promises do apply. And here's why, because uh, when you are living like that, God, the Holy Spirit will transform your own will and your mind so that you delight in the Lord and the things you want are in alignment with the will of God. So that's what this, these scriptures are promising. These scriptures promise that if you are praying in the will of God, then you can count on it. It's going to happen because the will of God will not be thwarted. And so God wants us to pray according to his will. So now do you understand why I read all those scriptures? Do you see the correlation between praying between those promises that I've just read and praying in tongues? Because if praying in tongues is actually the Holy Spirit praying through you in accordance with the will of God, and that is powerful, then, um, then the promises here all apply. So that is the power. Does that make sense? <laughs> I got really deep here today. Um, so that is the power. That is the deeper purpose, I believe of speaking in tongues, having a prayer language is, is being able to verbalize, sending up these prayers out into the atmosphere that are in accordance with the will of God. And God promises over and over and over again in the scriptures that when you pray in that way, it will be done. It will be done. Whew. Okay. Wow. All right. I kind of, <laughs> I kind of got overwhelmed with that for a minute. Okay, let me get my gather myself together here. All right. So anyway, here, let me just kind of go over this again really quickly. And we are at 54 minutes. So I'm 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 closing it down now. I'm coming to the end. All right. So so from in my opinion, this is the deeper purpose of this gift of speaking in tongues is that you're praying in alignment with God's will. Your own brain, your understanding is not required for that language that you're praying to have power. And it helps uh, to accomplish God's will on earth. Um, so that is deep. That is powerful. That is powerful. All right. So in the other thing, there's one other thing that I want to mention because I haven't mentioned it before. Um, a deeper, another purpose of speaking in tongues. And it's, it's not anywhere nearly as important as what I've just been describing. So it's a very practical thing. And that is that speaking in tongues allows you to pray more often. And here's what I mean. Um, so anytime, because it doesn't use your brain, <laughs> anytime you're doing something that doesn't require a lot of brain power, like 
doing housework or driving somewhere, you know, something like that, then you can teach your train yourself to um, speak in tongues during that. And so that is something that I practice. So, um, so I have gotten into the habit. I have intentionally trained myself to do this. Anytime I'm doing something that's kind of a mindless activity, like walking to the, the mailbox and our mailbox is really far. So it takes a long time <laughs> or doing the dishes or cleaning house or uh, driving somewhere or just walking across the house to get something. I usually am all, I'm speaking in tongues. I'm, I'm praying in my prayer language when I'm doing those things. And so I have this habit that allows me to pray all the time. And we are told, uh, Paul tells us in first Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. He tells us in Ephesians 6, with every prayer and request, pray at all times in the spirit. And so speaking in tongues allows us, helps us to be able to do that more easily. I think that if you don't have the, uh, if, if you're not able to speak in tongues, that it's much harder to pray unceasing, to pray all the time. So that's just another, one other, just little practical thing that I wanted to mention. Okay. So who we are rounding it down. We're almost at the end here. Um, let me check the comments for just a minute. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. All right, Ramona. I, I am seeing your comments, Ramona. And uh, so I, like I said, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to write back to you. I have gotten your emails and um, I am going to try as hard as I can to write back to you before next week's podcast. But anyway, okay. So thank you. Thank you, Ramona. I am seeing all of that. Um, all right. All right. All right. Um, so now what I want to do, I want to, for the very last thing that I'm going to do here, I want to, what are we at? 57. Okay. Um, let me get back to my banners. Okay. So I haven't talked about the, um, the last question in that list of questions that we were going over the past two weeks. And that is, if, is the gift of tongues for everyone? So I want to talk about that a little bit because last week what I said was that after going through all of the scriptures that we have in the Bible, I do not see support in those scriptures for teaching very clear support for teaching that every single Christian is supposed to speak in tongues. I just don't see it. I don't see necessarily clear, a clear indication that every single time you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are going to be speak. You are going to evidence that by speaking in tongues. I just don't see it. Now I want to say this. There are a lot of people, a lot of uh, very, very wise, very knowledgeable uh, Christians who disagree with me about that. A lot of Christians that I respect very much who teach that you do um, that, that you, that every time you're baptized in the spirits, the, the evidence is going to be speaking in tongues and that tongues is for everyone. So I want to bring that up because I could be wrong. <laughs> I want to make sure you know that I the, the things I'm telling you here, this is my opinion. Uh, I mean, even my pastor, this man that I love very much, he is very, very wise, and I respect him a great deal. And he, just last week, he was teaching about this, that, um, you know, that tongues is for everybody, and that that every time, you, when you are baptized in the Spirit, the, the evidence is going to be speaking in tongues. And um, and I respect him very much. He has been following God and being used at a capacity by God in ways that I could not even imagine. So um, it is it is very likely that I could be wrong. So I just want to say that. Um, but now notice there is a difference between what I'm saying that I don't see evidence that speaking, that every believer is supposed to speak in tongues. That is not the same question as this is speaking in tongues is a prayer language available to every Christian. That's a different question. Now I, in my, and I don't know the answer to that. Again, I don't see a clear answer in the scripture. So I don't know the answer. I hope so. My pastor believes so. And I love that idea. I really hope he's right. I, I love that. I want it to be something that everybody can get because of how wonderful I think it is. But I think the problem that I want to make sure doesn't happen is that people fixate only on that and that they, they feel like if they don't get it, they feel like they've done something wrong or that maybe God doesn't love them as much or their prayers aren't as powerful. Um, that's what I want to avoid. Um, so, but I will tell you this, I will tell you this, that if at this point in my life, if I 
at knowing what I know now, after my studies and deep diving into this, I, this, this whole thing of the gift of speaking in tongues, if I did not yet speak in tongues, I would want it. I would want it for myself and I would pray for it. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, he says, pursue love yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts. So there's nothing wrong with wanting these gifts. Paul tells us to desire these gifts. Um, so, so what I want to encourage you is very important that none of us fixate and elevate this gift of speaking tongues higher than what it is intended to be. It is the least of the gifts, but it's not unimportant. There is a lot of power. There is a lot of benefit from this gift of speaking in tongues. And so if, if you are someone who wants this gift of speaking in tongues, you do not yet speak in tongues, but you want it for the right reasons. You're not obsessing on the gift. You want, you want to be closer to Jesus. You understand uh, the things that I've been talking about. And because of that, you want everything that, that Jesus might have for you. If that is you, if that is you, then what I'm going to do to end up today is I am going to invite you to say a prayer with me. And I am going to, and you can repeat after me, and I'm going to say a prayer asking God for this, for a prayer language, for this gift of speaking in tongues. So if that is you, and you are desiring this gift of speaking in tongues, I would ask you to please repeat after me, and I'm just going to say a simple little prayer. All right. Are you ready? So if that is you, please repeat after me. Lord Jesus Christ, I worship you, and I praise you for Jesus. Lord Jesus, I recognize that you are the one who uh, distributes gifts of the Holy Spirit as you see fit. I recognize that. And Lord, we are told in 1 Corinthians 14 to eagerly desire the gifts. And Lord Jesus, I desire the gift of speaking in tongues. Lord Jesus, I ask you to give me the gift of a prayer language. Lord God, Lord Jesus, I give you, I release control to you, to the Holy Spirit of my mouth and my tongue and my vocal cords. Lord Jesus, I release to the power of the Holy Spirit all of me. Lord, I thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for your perfect will and plan for my life. I love you, Lord Jesus, and I worship you. In your holy name I pray. Amen. It's that simple. Now, if you prayed that prayer, here's what I, what I encourage you to do. Don't go do anything else except right now spend some time praying. Spend some time speaking to God. I'm not telling you to say, God, I have a Honda. Just speak prayer, spoken prayer to God. Just spend some time speaking to him using out loud using your tongue, using your vocal cords, using your mouth to speak to God. Okay. Just can continue asking him if you have not gotten it yet. Uh, spend some time worshiping, put on some worship music, sing out loud. It's very important that you're vocalizing, that you are just giving your tongue, giving your mouth and your, your vocal cords to, to God to do whatever he wants to do. With. And that is what I encourage you to do. Uh, and you may very well get, get this gift right now. Um, so I'm going to pray for you. I'm praying for everyone who prayed that prayer today. Um, if you did not get it yet, do not get discouraged. Do not get stressed out. Do not freak out. Do not think you've done anything wrong because you haven't. Keep asking for it. And if you want me to pray for you specifically, I am very, very happy to do that. Uh, this is my email address. Please feel free to reach out to me. I pray for every single request that comes in. Um, I, uh, I read all the emails. It does take me a long time to respond. I try to respond to everybody at this point. We're like months out because <laughs> I'm getting a lot of emails. So anyway, but if you would like for me to pray for you in this, um, there's my email address. Please feel free to reach out to me. Also, if you prayed this prayer and you did get your prayer language, I would love to know that I would like to celebrate with you. So please let me know that as well. And so you can say in the comments or you can, uh, send me an email. All right, so that is all that I have today. Let me look at the comments really quickly. Okay, oh, got a new new person here. Stormy, stormy days. Hello, thank you for your teachings. Well, thank you for watching, Stormy. 
All right, and here's Renee. Uh, thank you, sister. Thank you very much. All right, guys, that is all I have. I'm right. I'm at an hour and five minutes. Whew, I went. Uh, I went over. So so anyway, thank you so much for watching. Next week again, we're going to go through um, comments. Uh, questions, stories that people have shared with me. It's going to be a lot of fun um, and I'm going to respond. Uh, it should be very, very interesting. You can still write to me if you haven't and you, you have something you would like to share with me. Um, you can see my email address that I put down there a little bit ago and uh, please, please feel free to reach out to me. So I love you with the love of Jesus Christ. Please come back next week, same time, same place. Thank you so much for watching. Join Hands with Heaven. I'm Blue Tap. If you don't mind, please do me a favor and like and share this video. It really helps me a lot. And leave some comments as well. I'd love to hear from you and know your thoughts and get to know you a little bit better. Pretty please subscribe and hit that little bell icon so that you'll be the first to know when my next video comes out. And if you're interested in keeping up with me and my writings and my podcast, please join my email list by texting BLUE, B-L-U-E, to 3 three seven 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 and we'll get you all signed up jesus loves you and i love you in the name of christ let's join hands with heaven and do this body of christ thing together have a blessed day and i will see you next time peace read my demon my jesus blues memoir about her suicide out of body death experience and her miraculous healing companion workbook chaos calmed is a guide to christian meditative prayer and spiritual healing both books are available at Amazon.com.